In this video, I'm going to show you how to solve the Schrodinger equation for an electron in a spherical infinite potential well. I recently showed you how to solve the Schrodinger equation for an electron in a cylindrical infinite potential well, and now I'm going to do a spherical one. You could say that the solving for this case is technically more complicated, but there's a shortcut I'm going to take that actually makes it overall easier, and uh, uh, also it's simpler because instead of having three boundary conditions, we only need one. <clears throat> so I'm going to remind you what an infinite potential well is. An infinite potential well is a type of potential function that we could insert into the Schrodinger equation, but we can't just normally in, in, insert it. Um, because it's not a simple function. So most of the time when we have some potential and we want to solve the Schrodinger equation in it, it's some function that we just stick in there and we get a differential equation we can try and solve. But a, an infinite potential well potential function is not a normal type of potential function. It's a piecewise defined function <clears throat> which has two main regions, outside the potential well and inside. So the potential well itself is some finite volume closed region and inside the well the potential function is zero and outside the well the potential is infinity so you can see it isn't just a normal function we can stick in the Schrodinger equation and start solving so what we can do is we can think about what an electron would do in such an environment and get enough information just by thinking about it to figure out a way to simulate the potential uh, using boundary conditions and selecting the value of the wave function appropriately outside the well. So first we know that if the potential is infinite outside the well and zero inside, then the wave function is going to be zero outside because the electron is never going to be there. And we can solve the, sh the free Schrodinger equation for the electron inside because the potential is zero inside. So then we just need to impose boundary conditions that are the shape and size of the potential well uh, to make the wave function continuous. Specifically, we need to mandate that the wave function goes to zero at the boundary of the potential well. <clears throat> so then that tells us that we can simulate the infinite potential, which we can't just stick in there, and the infinite potential well potential function, which we can't just stick in there and start solving by... Uh, realizing that the wave function is zero outside the well, free inside, and that we can just use boundary conditions to uh, impose the rest of the effects of such a potential. So because uh, it's a spherical infinite potential well, we're going to use spherical coordinates, so that way the boundary condition that we impose is just one, and it's really easy to impose. We just impose that the wave function goes to zero at some radius. So this is the Schrodinger equation, the time-independent Schrodinger equation, because it's a time-independent problem, and we're solving for the... We're going to try and solve for the energy eigenvalues and the associated eigenfunctions. <clears throat> so if we're going to do this in spherical coordinates, we need the Laplacian in spherical coordinates, which is just this. So then the free space Schrodinger equation, the free space time-independent Schrodinger equation in spherical coordinates is this. And the boundary condition just says that for the spherical infinite potential well, the wave function needs to go to zeros at some radius, the radius of the potential well. Uh, and then we'll solve the free Schrodinger equation inside the well and set the wave function equal to zero outside the well to simulate that infinite potential well potential function, or its effect on the wave function anyway. Okay, so... Uh, this is a separable partial differential equation, so we'll use separation of variables. Before I did the separation, though, I multiplied by these constants, or their inverses, to get them on the other side here, and then I just hid them in this constant. And I uh, stuck indexes on the energy, knowing how the solution would work out. That's what we will end up needing. And so then I also stuck indexes on this A constant, just for the heck of it. Okay, so uh, then that ultimately gives us this function here, or this, this, uh, sorry, this differential equation here. And I've put all the parts that uh, will end up being the angular part and all the parts that will end up being radially dependent, purely radially dependent on separate sides. So that when we do the separation, which I've set up here, 
we'll be good to go. We'll basically get the answer or the, the, the separated equation right away. Okay, so I separated the radial part off of the angular part first, which is sort of the most common thing to do. Uh, I inserted this into the equation and then divided by the solution. And I set it equal to a separation constant. And the separation constant here was selected to make the angular equation easy to solve. This will make it uh, the equation satisfied by the standard spherical harmonics. And I need to pick the separation constant to be specifically this form for that to happen. Uh, so that's why I selected it to be that way. <clears throat> so let's look at the angular equation first. This is the angular equation. I then multiplied it by the solution to it, this y factor, to get this. Now, here's the, the shortcut that I, I think I mentioned at the beginning that makes it easier to solve. What you'd normally do is separate the two angular parts in this equation, and then uh, get two factors. One is the associated Legendre functions of cosine theta, and the other is an azimuthal phase, and then you'd normalize it. And that would give you the normalized spherical harmonics. But this is such a famous equation that shows up all over the place in quantum mechanics and other physics, you doubtlessly, or not necessarily doubtlessly, but you uh, quite likely have already seen this, or at least will see it if you haven't already. Uh, and so I'm not going to do that process again, since they show up everywhere and are just so standard. I'm just going to uh, tell you uh, to recognize that this is the, the spherical harmonics equation. And because we're in quantum mechanics, we need the normalized spherical harmonics. And the normalized spherical harmonics are famously these. So you see the associated Legendre functions of cosine theta that I mentioned that satisfy the uh, polar angular part and then the azimuthal phase. And then this thing with this epsilon function is just the normalization factor. <clears throat> so that's the thing that makes the, the angular solving part way easier because I just uh, recognized this ultra famous equation and said, yeah, this is this is just the spherical harmonics equation. Let's just write those out because we already know them so well. Okay, so then the radial equation is a little bit more interesting um, <clears throat> because uh, the spherical harmonics show up all over the place in spherically symmetric problems. They're a little bit less unusual. And in such problems, it's really the radial part that's interesting. So let's have a look at that. This is what the radial equation works out to be. Um, and, of course, if we multiply by that r, this becomes the uh, spherical bezel equation satisfied by these spherical bezel functions, where the argument is r times the uh, square root of the factor on that r squared there. It's just a standard solution to this equation. Now, uh, to impose the radial boundary condition, I take the square of the roots of the spherical bezel functions over the square of the radius of the potential well, and I stick those in. So then this is what the equation becomes, and the solutions to the equation turn into this. Now remember, these J and or LNs are defined as the roots of the bezel, uh, the spherical bezel functions. So then we can see that this does satisfy the boundary condition because we need to, this to go to zero, so the whole wave function goes to zero when R equals capital R. But when r equals capital R, it cancels the capital R in the denominator, and that just leaves the argument as purely roots of the bezel functions, which definitely goes to zero, sending the whole wave function to zero. Now it turns out the normalization factor on this is just one, so we're actually good to go. So we have the normalized spherical harmonics as a solution to the angular part, and these specially treated spherical bezel functions as a solution for the um, <clears throat> uh, radial part. And actually, uh, I forgot to mention one thing, and I think I may have forgotten to mention the analog thing uh, in the cylindrical case. This equation has actually two linearly independent solutions. These standard spherical um, bezel functions of the first kind, and then also spherical bezel functions of the second kind, and they're linearly independent. Um, but they have uh, problems with singularities <clears throat> they are not well-behaved functions that are uh, continuous and non-singular and satisfy the postulates of quantum mechanics, so we uh, ignore them. I'm pretty sure they're also called spherical Neumann functions, but I'm not totally sure on that. 
uh, but the standard spherical bezel functions of the first kinds are perfectly well behaved, totally non-singular solutions that we can uh, use without violating any quantum rules. So that's why we just picked those standard solutions and didn't include the other linearly independent ones. But anyway, back to where we were. This is the complete normalized wave function, the normalized spherical harmonics for the angular part, and the well-behaved first kind spherical bezel functions um, with an argument that makes them satisfy the boundary conditions here for the uh, um, <clears throat> radial part. Now, we had to, if you remember, set this uh, roots of the bezel function squared over r squared equal to this. But then, as you can see right here, this thing depends on the energy. So that means we can solve for the energy in terms of all the quantum numbers. Uh, this L here we got, and then the, the ones indexing the roots of the bezel functions and the bezel functions themselves. <coughs> Uh, so then, if we substitute the value for this a uh, ln in there, and then solve for the energy, we get this. So then we have a value for the energy in terms of the mass, Planck's constant, the radius of the well, and the roots, the the um, the nth root of the lth spherical bezel function. So then those are the uh, energy eigenvalues associated with each of these quantum states. And then, of course, you can square these, uh, this wave function to get the probability distribution corresponding to each of the quantum states. So that is how you solve the Schrodinger equation for an electron in a spherical infinite potential well. A very famous and very beautiful problem. Dietrich out.